We're on the phone today with Andrew Farrago. He is the author of the new book, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Ultimate Visual History. How are you doing today, Andrew? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I am excellent. I'm excited to speak with you about this new book. I've seen it. It, it looks beautiful. And uh, I'm assuming we must be around the same age. But uh, why don't you tell the listeners what made you decide to write this book? Okay. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd done a little writing before uh, for Insight Editions. They, they're the publisher. And uh, previously, I had done a Looney Tunes history uh, called the Looney Tunes Treasury. So I was uh, I was in their Rolodex if they've if they've still got such a thing. And uh, Chris Prince, who's an editor over there, called me up and said, you know, what do you what do you think about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? And you know, as as somebody who grew up on them, uh, my younger brother and I saw the. Um, first miniseries on TV when it aired in December of 1987, and we were crazy about it. And yeah, so uh, Chris Chris asked me what my pitch would be, and I told him you have to obviously start at the beginning with Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, who are the, who are the co-creators of the Turtles. And I, I sort of mapped out my whole game plan for it, and uh, I beat out, I don't know how many other authors, but uh, he liked my pitch, and... And I spent about two years researching and writing, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a it's a thrill to finally see this book um, in stores and uh, to see that it's getting such a great reaction from people. Yeah, and when it comes to uh, doing the research, as you mentioned, uh, you know, of course, people know the cartoon show and the toys and the movies, but I mean, I remember coloring books and the did the live action tours and Pizza Hut had cassette tapes and they had their own cereal. I mean, was it just? Um, your research skills, I mean, you know, you mentioned doing the Looney Tunes thing, so obviously you're able to uh, work a lot of info into, uh, you know, something more compact, but how do you decide what to leave in and what to trim down? Wow, yeah, they were, um, yeah, again, if you've, if you've seen the book or if you were alive in the 90s, you just know how <laughs> inescapable they were uh, for a period. You could, you could literally, you could, you could almost go, as they say, from cradle to grave, in uh, Ninja Turtles gear and food, and you probably could have survived uh, <laughs> on nothing but Ninja Turtles branded stuff. And that, that might even be possible today because they've, they've had a really big resurgence uh, recently now that Nickelodeon's taken over the property. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a really major, um, at times very daunting project because obviously, like I said, you start at the beginning with Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, who were just a couple of guys in New England in their studio who, who came up with this idea and started it, started it as a comic book, and then the licensing took off. So obviously I had to talk to the licensing guy, and then I had to talk to the people who um, picked up those initial licenses, like the toy company and the animation company. And literally every person I talked to would drop two or three new names of people that I really had to talk to. And it's it's the sort of thing that you know if I if I hadn't if I hadn't set some limits it, it could have really been a life's work. Again, we're on the phone here with Andrew Farrago, author of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: The Ultimate Visual History. And uh, we we know the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles started out from a black and white comic and eventually kind of just exploded, almost like um, Disney sort of business, as you were mentioning. And for some of the older listeners who might not have experienced that as a kid during the late 80s or early 90s, you know, they probably had kids who did. What do you think, in your opinion, is the reason why this thing just exploded like it did overnight? Well, uh, so, yeah, the, uh, the again, the two artists who created it were really passionate. They were big-time uh, big comic book fans. They were making a go of it as commercial illustrators. And, you know, they, they enjoyed that well enough, but their passion had always been comic books, uh, especially the comic books of Jack Kirby, and Jack Kirby is a name that everybody in the world should know. He's the uh, co-creator of most of the Marvel Comics properties that uh, have been around and entertaining us for the past 50 years uh, or more. He's actually the, he's actually also the co-creator of Captain America, who dates back almost 75 years at this point. And yeah, so they they wanted to do comic books. They they came up with they were in their studio one night and they start, they came up with this idea of drawing a turtle with weapons, and they went back and forth trying to one-up each other by drawing better and better turtles uh, until they realized, you know, if one turtle's funny, four turtles is going to be hilarious. And actually, it's it's back in November 1983, they came up with the name 
when they published their comic book, they, they went to their local library, they found out how to submit press releases, sent that around, and actually a, a big part of the reason that we've heard of them today is the Associated Press loved the title, they picked it up, and suddenly, before the first issue even came out, uh, they were the subject of some national news stories. You know, two, <laughs> uh, two dudes come up with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comic book to debut at New Hampshire Comic Book Convention in May 1984. And as a result, they, uh, you know, they, they took a big chance. They sunk their life savings into publishing that first issue. Uh, but as a result of that publicity, that first comic book sold out uh, overnight. Every comic shop in the country called them up and wanted copies of it. They they couldn't print them fast enough to uh, to meet demand, and that eventually yeah that eventually caught the attention of the licensing guy, uh, who said let's let's take this to the next level and make sure every kid in the country has a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles lunchbox toy jacket cereal <laughs> everything. So was there something you know during your research that really surprised you? It sounds like you had a pretty you know good knowledge of the product, but was there something that uh you didn't know about that that you found out when you were doing research for the book? Oh, uh, yeah, all kinds of things. We could be here all day, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was it was just fun hearing um, again again talking um, talking with these guys about Jack Kirby, for example, and finding out what a big inspiration he was to their work. They, uh, I found out they actually, and again, every every kid, every every parent who has had to buy these off the toy shelf. Uh, you know, you, you, they all know the, you know, Renaissance artists that the turtles are named for, uh, Leonardo, Donatello, Michelangelo, and Raphael. But, um, yeah, East, Eastman and Laird weren't, um, you know, they actually toyed with maybe naming the characters, um, giving the characters Japanese names since they were ninjas. But uh, I think that's, I think that's yet another reason that we've, we still know who they are today and that they're still popular characters. Is those are those are such great names. They're so evocative. They're so uh, immediately recognizable. And um, Peter Laird had actually been an art student at the University of Massachusetts. So, uh, like most art students, and I was uh, I was an art major too, and I had the same book. Uh, Jansen's History of Art is on the bookshelves of countless countless art majors across the country, and it has been for generations. And, uh, you know, they, they looked through that book. They, they picked four names that they thought really would resonate with the turtles. And, you know, if they'd been, if they'd been Mo, Larry, and Curly, we probably wouldn't know them today. <laughs> and if they'd also been, you know, if they'd just been, you know, the fighting turtles or the ninja turtles just by themselves, we, um, you know, they, they probably could, would have quietly faded away. But right place, right time, and uh, perfect names. And let's talk a little bit more about the the book itself, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: The Ultimate Visual History. I know lots of great artwork and information, but the book also has a lot of uh, extras. I guess you'd call them packed away, like flyers. And I think I had read the uh, first copy of the comic is in there. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the stuff you might find in there? Oh yeah, yeah. The um, the two years again of research and and everything that I put into this book. Uh, a big part of that was finding out where all the artwork is and, you know, talking to artists, talking to collectors, finding really, um, you know, images that were really going to pre- impress everybody from the absolute diehard fans who think they've seen everything to uh, the casual fans who maybe maybe they watched the cartoon in the 80s or maybe they just played the video games. Uh, I really wanted to have something for everybody in there. And one of one of the specialties of Inside Editions is they do amazing um, they do amazing art books. They they include uh, you know if they do a sports book, then they're going to include uh, replicas of vintage baseball cards and posters and ticket stubs and things like that. Uh, so I was I was really excited about that aspect of the book that they would be able to make a copy of the first press release that Eastman and Laird sent out to all those. Uh, all those press outlets back in the 80s. And uh, fortunately, because of my day job, I'm the curator at the Cartoon Art Museum in San Francisco. I I do know a lot of art collectors with really impressive collections, uh, including the the owner of the first, uh, the complete first issue of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So he's got all of the original artwork that uh, Kevin and Peter drew back in 1984. And he was kind enough to both let us display it at the museum, where, where it's 
where it can be seen right now through mid-September, uh, but also to let us uh, copy it and reproduce it and make a, a little mini replica edition comic book. So anybody who wants to see where the turtle started and see uh, see that very first comic book, uh, they've, they've got that option. So that's, that's tucked in there, uh, along with posters, along with... Um, you know, really, you're getting you're getting about twenty percent more book than normal with all the uh, with all the add-ins. Yeah, it sounds awesome for sure. One thing I wanted to ask you: this is kind of a weird question, but um, obviously, Vanilla Ice appears in uh, the second Turtles movie, and he was huge at the time as well with uh, the Ninja Rap. Can you tell us maybe what you took away from with speaking with Vanilla Ice for this book? Wow, yeah, that was that was such a fun experience. Uh, <laughs> I was in. I was in high school when Ice Ice Baby hit on the radio, and um, yeah, like I'll, I'll admit, like I, like everybody else, I I, I bought into it, <laughs> hook, hook line and sinker, uh, and it does show it it does show the um, yeah this is this is this has been true for rap and hip hop for ages, but if you get a, if you get a great sample, if you get a great hook like that, uh, a large uh, you know that's that's half the battle <laughs> in making a really memorable song. But yeah, that uh, he was he was riding high in the early '90s, and when it came time to do the second movie, well, actually, uh, people might not know, MC Hammer had a song on the first Ninja Turtle movie soundtrack, and that actually proved to be a surprise hit. The soundtrack sold really well; people responded really well to MC Hammer's song. And uh, when it came time to put the second movie together, they said, "Yeah, obviously, we've we've got to get this Vanilla Ice guy." So they had him on set. They wrote uh, they wrote the Ninja rap. And it was it was one of the more surreal experiences in putting the book together. Was uh, uh, talking to his management team, and they've they've been with him through thick and thin. They've been they've been uh, he's had the same management since the early '90s. And you know, I talked to them. I I, I assured them, you know, it's going to be a very respectful interview. We're going to have we're going to have fun. We're going to just talk shop. And yeah, before I knew it, I was on the phone with with uh, Vanilla Ice himself. And um, yeah, he he loves the turtles. He's got a he's got a huge turtles collection. He's got uh, he's got a Ninja Turtle tattoo, and he t- he told me that the uh, the Ninja rap when he performs it gets a, as big a reaction as anything else he does on stage. Uh, that so many so many of us grew up on it, and um, yeah, he was he was a he was a very cool, um, surprisingly down to earth. Uh, guy and I, uh, I'm not, I, I uh, have nothing surprisingly uh, or not surprising. I have nothing but uh, great things to say about uh, that experience. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, people still excited to hear that song, you know, from all those years ago. And now Nickelodeon taking over the franchise. A new movie is uh, coming out, so uh, it seems like the Ninja Turtles will probably be going on for at least another thirty years. Let's see, um, Kevin Eastman eventually sold his share of the property to Peter Laird, and uh, Peter was the sole owner of the Turtles in 2009 when he decided to sell to Nickelodeon, and the short explanation for that is he, you know, he turned 50, he'd been doing the Turtles for 25 years, literally half his life, you know, he, he, he basically realized that, you know, he, he really didn't want to spend the rest of his life in meetings with licensing departments and and doing all the and there's there's a lot of it there's a lot of day to day work and, and managing such a such a huge property, uh, but Nickelodeon had a had a really solid game plan. They they wanted to relaunch the comic books. They wanted to do new video games, new toys, new animation, new movies. And uh, you know he he liked what he heard and. Uh, I've been I've been really impressed with with what they've done so far. My my five year old nephew loves <laughs> absolutely loves the uh, the current cartoon on Nickelodeon, and I'm enjoying the comic books that uh, a San Diego based publisher called IDW is publishing right now. Uh, Playmates is doing some of the best toys that they've ever done, tying in with the uh, the animated series. And I actually saw a sneak preview of the movie last night, and I, I personally had a great time. And again, the book, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Ultimate Visual History, and I'm sure everyone's going to want to go out there and get a copy. Where can we find the book? Okay, uh, obviously obviously, any of your big um, chain bookstores or your online uh, sellers are going to have it. 
Uh, what, would, what would make me really happy would be if people would go to their local comic book stores or their local independent bookstores and order it. Uh, they're always happy to do things like that. Uh, you can call 1-800-COMIC-BOOK if you want to find the comic shop that's closest to you. Uh, a lot of them carry it or will be happy to order it for you. Uh, but really, yeah, really it's available just about everywhere right now. Excellent. Again, author Andrew Farago, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Ultimate Visual History. Thanks a lot for being on with us today. Okay, thanks for having me.